for campus craziness, and tonight the title is not an overstatement, it really is crazy. Consider Evergreen State College in Washington and Olympia. Every year the school holds a day in absence. In years past, non-white students symbolically left campus and attended anti-racism events. This year, student activists demanded that all white people leave campus or else. Brett Weinstein refused. He's a professor at Evergreen State, and he called the race-based demand, quote, a show of force and an act of oppression. In response to that, here's what happened. This is not about you. I'm we are not this is all about terms him. On terms of white privilege. This is not a discussion. You have lost that one. You said some racist Can you I did not. I did this not. Okay. Stop telling people color the useless. You're useless. Get the History could pivot in the direction of the values that you are standing here for. Yeah, resign. What? Resign. <laughs> wow. Professor Brett Weinstein joins us now. Professor, first of all, thank you for coming on. That looks like something, you know, out of Phnom Penh, 1975. Was that, I mean, what exactly was going on there? What happened? Well, uh, what happened is that 50 or so students decided to disrupt the class that I was holding that morning and demand my resignation. Because you wouldn't leave campus because you're white? Uh, well, they imagine that I am a racist and that I am teaching racism in the classroom and uh, that has caused them to imagine that I have no right to speak that I'm harming students by the very act of teaching them. What happened after the video cut out? Well, that's an interesting story. The, um, the campus police apparently showed up outside of the classroom. Uh, the protesters then blocked their entrance. They, uh, I did not call the police. Someone else called the police and they were concerned for my safety. But when they tried to come into the building to make sure that I was okay, the protesters blocked them, and because um, the issue of policing is so sensitive at the moment, the police had to run around and find another entrance to the building to get inside and check with me. Uh, at the point they did that, the protesters moved on and uh, corralled the president of the college uh, at his office. They extracted some demands from him. Among the demands was that there would be a uh, a meeting, well actually demands is perhaps the wrong word, a concession, that there would be a meeting at four o'clock in uh, a large room on top of our library building. Uh, so um, that meeting took place at the end of the day and believe it or not it was far crazier than the video that you just showed. Th this whole story is so over the top that it, even though we do a lot of these, it's hard for me to believe it's real. So the, the core demand is that all people of your skin color leave the campus. Your president is a guy called George Bridges. Where George was Bridges. he? Why isn't, there he is right there. Why, George Bridges is supposed to be running this school. Why is he allowing mo a mob to threaten one of his professors? Well, I must say, um, I have some concern that the story is so strange that it's not even going to make sense to an audience that isn't local to the campus. Um, Dr. Bridges is allowing this mob to effectively control the campus, and uh, they have been in control since 9.30 on Tuesday morning. Uh, at this moment, I believe Dr. Bridges is answering a set of demands put forward by the protesters um, and they have said that if he does not uh, if he does not accept their demands that there will be violence. I do not know what his response to those demands is going to be but I know that that's taking place at this hour. He has also told the police to stand down so although the campus police have a sense of what it is that needs to happen in a circumstance like this, they have been hobbled by the fact that they answer to the college administration and in fact for several days have been barricaded in the campus police station. Oh my gosh, this is like something out of another country. I, I, it's just hard to believe any of this is real and just our, our viewers should look this up online because there's there are a lot of pieces to the story. It's hard to convey on television but you had this I thought powerful line in your letter, and I assume you're no kind of right winger. If you teach at Evergreen, I'm sure you're, you know, a Hillary voter. But you had this, 
You had this. No, no, not a not a Hillary voter. I'm a I'm a I'm a deeply progressive person, um, and oh, okay. I must say so, I'm. There you go. go. I'm I'm troubled by what this implies about the current state of the left. Well, you think? You said people shouldn't be allowed to speak or not on the basis of their skin color, which seems like a foundational belief of the left and one that I agree with strongly. And for that, they physically threatened you and are trying to get you fired. This is uh, yes, unbelievable. They are absolutely trying to get me fired, and they believe that um, my words in my email are transparently racist. And I think we're caught quite off guard when people who were not at Evergreen read my letter and couldn't find any racism in it. Well, yeah, just the, just the opposite. Professor, Godspeed to you, and I hope you'll come back with an update on this story because it's really one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. Thank you. At least two dozen Democratic congressmen, at least one Republican, have brought illegal immigrants to Capitol Hill to watch the speech tonight, sending the defiant message that American law is irrelevant even in the chamber where it's made. Congressman Tim Ryan is a Democrat from Ohio. His guest is an empty seat, and he's keeping it empty in honor of a constituent who has been deported. The congressman joins us tonight. Congressman, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Tucker. So your seat is empty in honor of one of your constituents who was deported, and you're trying to put a name and a face to his story, which I understand, to the issue. And, but I wonder if you'll consider a couple other names and faces. These are your constituents also. The first is Jordan Johnson from Austin Town. He died in November of an OD. He was 27. He was a member of the Laborers Union in Youngstown Local 125. He went to Fitch High School. He leaves behind his parents, three brothers, a sister, and a grandmother. Randy Steeler of Youngstown died in April. He was 55. He played guitar, rode his Harley. He spent 30 years as a truck driver. He was a Steelers fan. Those are names and faces, and I wonder why you're not keeping a seat open to honor them. Well, we've been trying to honor them with our work. If you're talking about the heroin epidemic that's been uh, raging through places like Ohio and New Hampshire and West Virginia, we've been working real hard to get President Trump n not just to just declare it an emergency, but to put some real resources behind prevention and treatment. And what President Trump tried to do with his health care bill was throwing people off of health care so they would not have the opportunity to get the kind of treatment and recovery that they would need, Tucker. So you honor people through your actions, and yes. I want to honor Amur for sure. But there's there's Teamsters who aren't getting their pensions. Their pension's going to get cut in half. I want to honor them too. There's coal I miners agree. who have lost their pension. I want to honor them too. Well, there's a I lot think, of people that need. And I think you need, should. I need think to you should to work on their behalf. I think I think you should. But you're not doing that tonight, symbolically. And I agree with you, of course. Honoring someone is much more than hey, leaving Tucker. a seat open. But that's what you're choosing to do tonight. You hey, have one hey, seat Tucker. open, and you're leaving it open for someone who's deported, not for the people losing their pensions or your constituents who've died, the thousands of them in Ohio who died last year of drug abuse but for someone who was deported for fraud. Why is that? Hey, hey, Tucker, you're talking about this issue. And so, therefore, this empty seat is already working because you're talking about a man who's been in this country for 40 years, American wife, four American daughters, paid taxes, was the first business person to move into downtown Youngstown when no one else would to start a business. And we've had a renaissance mm -hmm. since then because of his investment. You think it's a good idea? with, a, with a, a case that has a lot of discrepancy to it, for this man not to have a fair hearing of, of the facts of the case, which is all we asked for, you think it's a good idea that he doesn't even get a fair hearing and well, he no, gets no, ripped no. from our I'm community, not, I'm not his saying, family? I'm not saying America, that. America, America I, no, but hold on, that, hold on. Wait, slow down, slow down. I'm not saying that. And I have no trouble believing he was a great guy. I think a lot of immigrants, including those here illegally, a lot of them are great people and they work hard. And if they're deported, it's sad. But it doesn't answer the question that what do you do with people who are here illegally? You're a lawmaker. If you don't like the law, you have a chance to change it. You're arguing instead to ignore it. Why? No, I'm, I'm not arguing to ignore the law. Yes, you are. I was, in this particular case, I was asking for this man to have a fair hearing of evidence in his case that nobody has heard that would allow him to assimilate into the country. Yes. And this this issue we're dealing with, with, with DACA and with the Dreamers, was not an issue until President Trump made it an issue. And okay. let me just say one thing, Tucker. This is not an either or. I am for border security. I am uh -huh. for making sure we have enough board, border patrol to make sure drugs don't get in our country. I'm for throwing felons the hell out 
lot of the country. But when you are someone who's a law-abiding citizen, you're paying taxes, you're a net benefit to the United States, I think if you pay a fine, yeah. if you pay some back taxes, and you learn English if you don't already know it, we should figure out a way in the next okay. five to ten years to get you into the country and then, then expedite people then who are waiting can, you can pass Then you can pass that law. And by the way, I'm not, look, I think what you're describing sounds like a sad situation. There are a lot of sad situations in Ohio right now. 4,000 people died of drug ODs. 400 were deported. By a factor of 10, drug ODs are a bigger deal. And you're spending know, your time and the symbolic power you have to honor someone who's deported rather than one of your constituents who died of a drug OD. Hey, and I don't hey, understand hey, why. Tucker. It's a simple question. Hey, Tucker, I've spent more time on the opiate epidemic in my career than you have. Yeah, ever. not tonight. And a lot not of tonight. other people and that are going to be criticizing very clear me. Tonight. So I'm not taking a back seat to you or anybody else on the yeah, opiate okay. epidemic. You tell your president and your party to fund the damn bills we yeah. try to put forth to make sure that these people can get treatment and Look, recovery. I may agree if with you. So well, let me just say, I may agree if, with you on so some of that. With no, that. I may agree hey, with you. If you're so uh, but you've got a chance that, to send a symbolic message, and you're sending it. We know where your priorities treatment are. And recovery. You, okay. We know where your priorities are, Tucker. Yeah. Do Thanks, something about it. Use your... I am. Don't forget to click subscribe. It's almost as satisfying as skip ad. Hello, everyone. Hey, I'm just stopping by to remind you that liberals are insane. <laughs> Social justice warriors are becoming more violent and triggered than ever before. Anyways, be sure to subscribe to KGP TV on YouTube and have a blessed day. Yeah, man. Now for campus craziness, and tonight the title is not an overstatement, it really is crazy. Consider Evergreen State College in Washington and Olympia. Every year the school holds a day in absence. In years past, non-white non students symbolically left campus and attended anti-racism events. This year, student activists demanded that all white people leave campus or else. Brett Weinstein refused. He's a professor at Evergreen State, and he called the race-based demand, quote, a show of force and an act of oppression. In response to that, here's what happened. This is not about you. I'm talking we are about not this is all on about terms, him. On terms of white privilege. This is not a discussion. You have lost that one. You said some racist. Can you I did apologize? Not. I did not. Okay. Stop telling people how the useless. You're useless. Get the History could pivot in the direction of the values that you are standing here for. Yeah, resign. What? Resign. Wow. Professor Brett Weinstein joins us now. Professor, first of all, thank you for coming on. That looks like something, you, you know, out of Nam Pen 1975. Was that, I mean, what exactly was going on there? What happened? Well, uh, what happened is that 50 or so students decided to disrupt the class that I was holding that morning and demand my resignation. Because you wouldn't leave campus because you're white? Uh, well, they imagine that I am a racist and that I am teaching racism in the classroom and uh, that has caused them to imagine that I have no right to speak, that I am harming students by the very act of teaching them. What happened after the video cut out? Well, that's an interesting story. The, um, the campus police apparently showed up outside of the classroom. Uh, the protesters then blocked their entrance. They, uh, I did not call the police. Someone else called the police, and they were concerned for my safety. But when they tried to come into the building to make sure that I was okay, the protesters blocked them. And because um, the issue of policing is so sensitive at the moment, the police had to run around and find another entrance to the building to get inside and check with me. Uh, at the point they did that, the protesters moved on and uh, corralled the president of the college uh, at his office. They extracted some demands from him. Among the demands was that there would be a, uh, a meeting, well, actually, demands is perhaps the wrong word, a concession, that there would be a meeting at 4 o'clock in uh, a large room on top of our library building. Uh, so 
um, that meeting took place at the end of the day, and believe it or not, it was far crazier than the video that you just showed. This whole story is so over the top that it, even though we do a lot of these, it's hard for me to believe it's real. So the, the core demand is that all people of your skin color leave the campus. Your president is a guy called George Bridges. Where George was Bridges. he? Why isn't, there he is right there. Why, George Bridges is supposed to be running this school. Why is he allowing mo a mob to threaten one of his professors? Well, I must say, um, I have some concern that the story is so strange that it's not even going to make sense to an audience that isn't local to the campus. Um, Dr. Bridges is allowing this mob to effectively control the campus, and uh, they have been in control since 9.30 on Tuesday morning. Uh, at this moment, I believe Dr. Bridges is answering a set of demands put forward by the protesters, um, and they have said that if he does not, uh, if he does not accept their demands, that there will be violence. I do not know what his response to those demands is going to be, but I know that that's taking place at this hour. He has also told the police to stand down. So although the campus police have a sense of what it is that needs to happen in a circumstance like this, they have been hobbled by the fact that they answer to the college administration and, in fact, for several days have been barricaded in the campus police station. Oh, my gosh. This is like something out of another country. I, I, it's just hard to believe any of this is real. And just our, our viewers should look this up online because there's, there's a lot of pieces to the story. It's hard to convey on television. But you had this, I thought, powerful line in your letter. And I assume you're no kind of right winger. If you teach at Evergreen, I'm sure you're, you know, a Hillary voter. But you had this... You had this no, no, not a, not a Hillary voter. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a deeply progressive person, um, and oh, okay. I must say, so, I'm, there you go. Go, I'm, I'm troubled by what this implies about the current state of the left. Well, you think? You said people shouldn't be allowed to speak or not on the basis of their skin color, which seems like a foundational belief of the left, and one that I agree with strongly. And for that, they physically threatened you and are trying to get you fired. This is uh, unbelievable. Yes, they are absolutely trying to get me fired, and they believe that um, my words in my email are transparently racist. And I think we're caught quite off guard when people who were not at Evergreen read my letter and couldn't find any racism in it. Well, yeah, just the, just the opposite. Professor 